Hey boys and girls, uh, welcome back to Monroe Live. Um, I, uh, I need to discuss a little bit about uh, what's going on with uh, Celestique. That's the new GM product that was featured in the SAE magazine and basically um, uh, a fabulous article written by, <coughs> I'll move in closer, Lindsey Brook. You can see his picture there. Uh, he's shy, camera shy, he didn't want me to show it, but there you go, I'm gonna show it anyway. So we're going to put in a, um, uh, a little uh, link so that you can get, a have, get the chance to look at this and make sure that I didn't make any mistakes. What I wanted to talk about was three technologies that um, are extremely important in the industry <clears throat> that GM has jumped into. This is strictly about the Cadillac and the future. Maybe I should have said that the other way around. Maybe I should have said the future and how Cadillac is exploiting it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about two guys. Uh, one guy is named uh, Jeremy L uh, Loveday, and the other guy is Tony Roma. And if you're in the auto industry, these are two names that you'd know. Uh, Jeremy uh, worked on the EV1, and he was the engineering manager for the uh, Celestique. And Tony Roma is the chief engineer uh, for this $300,000 luxury vehicle. What the objective is, is to put Cadillac back to where it used to be a long time ago as a, uh, a, a luxury vehicle that could compete with the European vehicles like the Rolls-Royce and the Bentley and whatnot. I'm not 100% sure whether they're gonna make that happen, but I do want you to know about the three technologies that they're, they're using in this product that I think are really advantageous. Uh, number one is castings. Um, they're using gravity sand. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. Uh, they may also use lost foam. I'm not 100% sure, but we'll see uh, when the product comes out. I'll get a chance to look at it. I doubt very much we're ever gonna buy one of these things. And I wanna talk about how they got to where they got to as far as sand castings and who did it um, and is kind of like famous for it uh, in the past. Then I want to talk about additive manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, and on what, what basis or why they would even want to consider something like this for a low, low volume car. And then I'm going to talk about super plastic forming. They call it something else, warm forming or something like that. But at the end of the day, these are the three big technologies that I want to discuss today. Um, so let's talk about the first one, which is the uh, is the castings made out of like a, like a sand casting. There's three different methods that you can use. Um, one is a patterned uh, a casting where you ram up a pattern. You take the, the, the cope and the drag apart after you've powdered it. You take it apart and, um, and you remove the pattern. Then you put it back together. And when it goes back together, it's got it's got sprues and cores and whatnot already put in place. Then you pour in um, uh, molten aluminum. And then what happens is it fills up. After it cools for a little bit, you pull it apart, you pull out the part, and then you start whacking off sprues, gates, and uh, pull out cores and things like that. Then after that, what you do is you go in and, um, and you have to heat treat it to a T6 condition. And then you can, excuse me, <clears throat> And then you can, you, can manu you can machine it using high-speed um, high machining techniques. Now, who did this first? Um, this is the Tesla Model S Plaid. And you can see here that this is a casting. But this, is a, this isn't the casting that, that we were just talking about. This is not a green sand casting. This is a casting that's die cast. But when Tesla first brought the Model S out, in order to reduce the cost associated with, uh, uh, with tooling and whatnot, um, they, they decided to use a sand casting, exactly what GM is doing. If you have low volume, then sand casting is not a bad idea. But it does have a problem. When you have a sand casting, you're stuck with extra material. In the case of aircraft, it, you have to double it if it's a sand casting double the thicknesses because there's it's just not as strong in automotive we usually use about 50 percent more why did tesla go to die casting and the expensive tools that it goes along with it 
I believe they did that because they wanted to reduce weight. And they saw that the Model S Plaid, or the Model S, was going to get into much more than the original low volume that, uh, that everybody thought it was going to have. So if we look at the difference between the smoothness and if we come over here, <laughs> it's the only engine we got left in, uh, at Monroe. And if we look down here, you can see that this, this surface is much rougher. Now this is a semi-permanent mold, but at the end of the day, it's got, the outside is made out of sand. And, um, and this is kind of what the casting will probably look like if um, GM is using a ram up or, uh, or uh, a semi-permanent mold, or uh, there's a third option. And by the way, you can see the difference. See the graininess here? You can feel the bumps and whatnot. But then you go up here on the same engine and you can see the, um, this is smooth. This is a die casting. Now there's a, a third option and that's called lost foam. So what happens with lost foam, I don't have any big pieces anymore, but if we have a lost foam casting, it'll look, it looks like, a, like something you'd get coffee in, okay? It's, um, it is styrofoam. So if I take the styrofoam and I put it into sand and I ram it up and I put a couple of sprues and gates, usually they're attached to the styrofoam part, and then I pour molten material in, molten aluminum, what happens is this sublimates. In other words, it goes from a solid to a gas. And when that happens, it leaves a void that is quickly filled up by the aluminum, actually simultaneously. And this gives you a very fast, cheap way of making componentry that, um, that could be as big as the Celestique or as small as this little uh, trunnion here. At the end of the day, there are three different, those are the three different methods that can be used for casting. And, um, and I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe that, um, that uh, for the beginning part of this, uh, of this launch for the uh, Celestique, I think it's what it's going to be, it's going to be, it'll be a green sand mold, which means that it'll have um, a pattern that'll be rammed up and then gates and sprues and whatnot will go to it to fill it up so that it can be uh, manufactured. It's an inexpensive way of making these giant castings and that will be able to tell them whether or not they in the future need to invest. If they need to invest in these five big casting or six big castings that they've got, the cost is going to be pretty heavy duty. They'll need at least a 6,000 ton, maybe a, an 8,000 ton uh, press in order to make these things work. And the, the investment cost is pretty significant. So we look at things in a different light um, when we're looking at low volume. And for low volume, the sand casting idea is probably a good one. Uh, although if you've got anything that's got any kind of volume, say 50, 25 to 50,000, then your best bet is to start thinking about going to the giga casting systems that, uh, that Tesla is using with die casting. And by the way, these systems are being um, put in place all over the world, both here in the United States and North America, I should say, and also when we start looking over at, um, over at our friends from Europe, China, Japan, Korea, everybody's moving in that direction. Okay, so let's move on to that second technique. And we call this 3D printing or additive manufacturing. A lot of times what you use um, additive or 3D printing for is a prototype. So we did a product with Ford and we came up with a new idea. This is the 3D model that we created in order to show what the product would look like. The 3D model we created was then turned into this mold. So this is the, uh, this is the battery tray that, uh, that uh, came out of our, our analysis and our redesign. This saved about four million bucks a year over the original design that they had and, um, and got rid of some really nasty, um, some really nasty problems. But you can see that um, what we came up with, sorry, what we came up with was very, very close 
to what the ultimate product uh, should look like. And this type of a process is what you use to create a visual representation of what it is that you want to manufacture. So, okay, that's, that's pretty good. And by the way, in some cases, you can use one of these after it's plated to make sure that it stays, uh, so stays right. You can use these types of products, these uh, 3D printed products, to create um, the sand casting or the mold for the sand casting that, uh, that we talked about just earlier. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to using 3D or additive manufacturing, but there's better ones. Now, this is a ball inside of a ball, okay? Uh, you can't do this, you can't manufacture this in any other way but with additive manufacturing. Let's have a look at this one. This is a little planet going around in a circle. It doesn't come out because I did this, or the company that, uh, that gave this to me, they did it using additive manufacturing. This one, it can't be manufactured, period, any other way than what you see here. This is a, um, <clears throat> this is a heat exchanger. And um, here's your inlet and outlet, and all of these different grills and whatnot, that's what's cooling this thing down. This is impossible to build normally. But with additive manufacturing, you can do stuff just like this. And this is from, this is from Trump, and this one here is from um, uh, Yangering, Yangering Group, um, and they're, uh, they're in Farmington Hills. And this, uh, oh, and you can see their little name here, but you can see that these chains, how, how in the world would you actually make anything like this if you weren't using additive manufacturing. Now, if there's interest, we can do a, a deeper dive on this, but I think we already talked a little bit about it when we were talking about um, our friends over at, uh, at uh, 3D Systems or, or uh, Trump. And uh, actually, I, I may be going to Germany to talk to them about what I see in the auto industry sometime in February. Now, <clears throat> I, I really think that you should know one other thing. When you're going to Mars, uh, you can't bring a lot of spare parts with you. So what NASA devised, or what NASA asked us to quote on, we didn't get the, the project, but what NASA asked us to quote on was a 3D system that could fit inside of a uh, module that was going to Mars, but it would have to work in, in like with zero gravity. Now normally, you would pick different materials for different parts that could fail. But in this case, the only thing we could possibly make work uh, would have been titanium. Titanium is light, light it's strong, it's tough. It's kind of like the ultimate material, but it's really expensive. If you had a machine that would work in zero gravity, because this is dust that you're gluing together with laser beams, if it would have worked, then that would have been the right machine to bring instead of a myriad of different parts. All I need is what, my computer with a computer data in it and, and one of these machines to manufacture something that could look like that. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that we see in the future as uh, being absolutely, um, absolutely uh, essential, essential for low volume or for maintenance. Right now, people buy parts, they stick them in warehouses, and they wait until something dies or breaks, and then they bring it back in and, and uh, they can get the machines going again. But I just came back from Saudi Arabia, and they showed me a product where the, the, the supplier of the turbine uh, couldn't get products to them, parts to them, in three months. Well, they had no other choice, so they said, okay, fine. And then when it was supposed to show up, they said, oh, we need three more months. Bear in mind that this is controlling a huge portion of the grid. Everybody's going on, on blackout cycles and whatnot, but they can't get the spare part. With 3D printing, they could have made their own part. And that's precisely why companies that are in the uh, power generation or any low volume uh, product that has a very high spinning turbine like, uh, like the... Um, like the turbines that are used to make electricity using gas, all these different things. 
if I have a 3D printer that is big enough to manufacture the parts that I need, then I'm going to be in. And by the way, that is one of the big problems. 3D printers um, don't usually accept great big giant parts. So, and they are relatively expensive, but at the end of the day, they can save your tail if you've got the CAD data to manufacture the part. So let's talk a little bit about the other uh, technology that I'm kind of excited about for the Celestique. And that is what we used to call, or what we call, uh, super plastic forming. What GM calls um, warm forming. And in essence, what you do is you warm up the aluminum and then it's like vacuum forming or suction blow mold, not suction blow mold, but uh, well, it has both positive and negative pressures to make parts that look like this. Now what's cool about this is it gives you a uniform thickness. It does it with, um, with tooling that's very inexpensive. The machine is relatively inexpensive and in the olden days, it was a real problem because there was a, there was a patent on it and copyrighted this and everything. But here's the, here's the real benefit. Now this is a door inner, which means that mm, this is gonna take a lot of uh, strength and whatnot, but the Celestique is using it for outside, outside parts. And if we look at this, if I was picking up a chunk of steel this thick, I wouldn't pick it up. It, it just wouldn't happen. This would be impossible for me to pick up. And if I was a tool maker, these corners, <laughs> these are impossible as well. But with, uh, let's use their term, warm forming, I can get all kinds of insane detail. This is tough to do if you're, if you're, looking, at, um, if you're looking at stamping this out. And you can see that this goes all the way around. And back here, you've got undercuts. These are all relatively simple to do when you're looking at a low volume process that gives you all kinds of uh, uh, design opportunities at, at, at low volume. So super plastic forming or warm forming, whatever you want to call it, this is a great thing for um, uh, good, inexpensive manufacturing, relatively inexpensive manufacturing for exotic shapes and low volume. These are all the things that GM's doing right now. So what's GM using? Okay, so for those areas where they're gonna see uh, a lot of uh, moisture or salt and whatnot, they're using five series aluminum, 5,000 series aluminum. So this is, uh, is kind of what you need or want for anything that has to do with um, getting into the climate or or anything that's going to be looking at salt water and things like that. That's, that's what they're using for those things that are come, come in contact with that. So then you get 6,000 series aluminum and there's a, dozens of different kinds of aluminums at 6,000. Um, the aircraft companies use it, uh, but we're getting into lots of 6,000 series aluminums and that's what they're going to be using for the casting because it's, um, it's, it's weldable, it's machinable, depending on which one you pick, it can be weldable, uh, machinable, and you can do spot welds. They said they're gonna be using spot welds for, the, uh, for these gigantic castings. My guess is it'll be a combination of TIG, tungsten inert gas, and, um, and spot welds in order to make that happen. And then there's 7,000 series. These are ultra strong series aluminums and you'll find those um, in things like the, um, well, let me, let me ask you a question. Have you ever flown in an airplane and looked out the window and watched the wings? They kind of move quite a bit. That's because the spars are made out of 7,000 series aluminum. That's the uber strength aluminum that you need in order to make sure that the wings can flex for like 60 years and, um, and not break or fatigue um, or actually go in the other direction and become brittle. These things are exotic. Again, we don't see too much 7,000 series aluminum in automobiles. It's usually reserved for fighter jets, um, big aircraft in the spars, um, and in some of the ribs. It's, it's like extremely expensive. So 
But for a car that's going to cost 300, or sorry, it's going to sell for $300,000, that's going to be at low volume, absolutely a perfect pick. So um, people have complained to me about how come you didn't say something nice about GM. Um, I thought that the article told it all, uh, but based on the feedback that I've been getting from different, uh, different folks, I thought it would be best to let you know that I'm extremely impressed with what GM is doing on this new Cadillac. I think that they've got a winner. I, uh, the style is kind of like um, uh, different people have different opinions. I don't think it's uh, bad, but other people say it's hideous and I don't know. But I do know one thing. Uh, GM, from a manufacturing standpoint, has taken a bold move in moving in toward the three technologies we just talked about today. Anyways, um, there's a thing that says Ask Monroe. If you need more detail or you want more detail on what different things happen or maybe who, uh, who might be manufacturing the products, what, what supplier and whatnot, you can hit that and uh, we'll get back to you. Otherwise, thanks for watching Monroe live and uh, we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Bye.